Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, uh, even though we do have some additional folks coming online. I'm Lee McDonald. I'm the Director of Counseling, Health and Wellness for the District. I'd like to welcome you to our latest uh, Coping with COVID series. Uh, tonight's focus is on child and adolescent anxiety. I'm joined by a few of my colleagues, which I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, number one, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, number two, we will make sure that we open up the chat uh, for any questions. Um, you know, if we take questions during the presentation, um, we'll, we'll try to do so, but more likely we'll take most of them at the end as, uh, as questions do arise and we get through the presentation. Uh, also, uh, I'll make sure that this is, is posted on the district YouTube channel in the coming days. Also make sure that it's sent out via Twitter uh, on the district's uh, uh, Twitter file uh, account and also on our WWB counseling uh, account as well. So uh, with that said, I am joined by uh, Ms. Jennifer Colello. She is one of our Rutgers University Behavioral Clinicians uh, at High School North. Uh, she's housed at High School North, but serves students uh, not only at North, but uh, across the district as well. Uh, Ms. Natalia Piotrowski uh, is a clinician at uh, Community Middle School, but also works with students across the district. She'll be joining us here momentarily. Uh, and we also have two other clinicians, one housed at Grover Middle School, uh, Ms. Abby Labourette, uh, and then also a clinician at High School South. Um, so uh, Ms. Mary-Kate Hardy. So um, just a little bit about Rutgers University Behavioral Health and our partnership that was started about three years ago. Uh, our clinicians serve in a variety of roles. Uh, first and foremost, they work with our students and families through any uh, acute crisis situations um, that do arise from time to time and support our families through that process, making sure that they're appropriately screened and, and connected with uh, therapeutic supports as needed. Uh, number two, they also serve as, as case managers to guide those families as they go through that therapeutic experience, as they re-enter our schools, as they work with our school counselors, our our child study team members, our building administration, our teachers, certainly. So uh, they also provide staff professional development. Uh, they also work on things such as tonight's presentation, uh, parent universities so are working with our parents um, and just consult in a lot of different ways regarding mental health. So we're really uh, thrilled to have them with us um, in terms of the referral process. Just wanna highlight that we work that through our uh, school counseling department, our child study team to make appropriate referrals to our UBAC clinicians uh, as need needed and as appropriate. Um, so with tonight's topic, it's understandable uh, as we head into um, uh, the spring season as we look to bring more students back on campus as you can imagine the last year has been uh, traumatic to say the least for for all of us truthfully uh, and our children certainly are no different uh, whether it's a coronavirus pandemic uh, whether it's uh, school shootings social justice issues um, all sorts of things uh, the capital riots uh, these are things that our kids are processing we're processing as adults uh, these are things that cause anxiety uh, that help drive some of the stressors as we think about our day-to-day -day lives and certainly as we think about our role within our school community. So um, our kids are going through a lot. We're all going through a lot and we recognize that uh, part of the reason why we're, we're having this webinar and we'll make it available and we're here to support you through that process. So, um, you know, our clinicians, again, will highlight uh, much of the reasons kind of behind uh, not only child and adolescent anxiety, but help you as parents kind of understand what you can do at home. We're going to provide a ton of resources at the end of this presentation as well. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Uh, Jennifer Colello to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, and thank you to everyone that is joining us tonight to talk about this very important topic. So tonight we are going to be talking about child and adolescent anxiety. And before we get started, I want to share some statistics with you that are pretty humbling and important to be aware of. So according to the National Institute of Mental Health, approximately 31.9% of 13 to 18 year olds have an anxiety disorder and just under 8.3% have a severe anxiety disorder. Now, comparatively, the statistics for the 2019 year the rates were 25%. In the year 2020, they raised to 31.9% for an anxiety disorder. That raised approximately almost 7% within a year. As well as for our severe anxiety disorders, the overall rates rose from 6% to 8.3% in one year. 
Now, there are many contributing factors, including the COVID-19 pandemic and normal life stressors, but it is important to be aware of that anxiety is a prevalent issue that we need to be aware of. Additionally, the Child Mind Institute took a poll of parents that had reached out for um, mental health services during the 2020 year and found that parents that were reaching out for assistance for telehealth services for their child or adolescent found that 78% of parents agree that social distancing and less in-person contact have been difficult for their child. Additionally, more than two thirds of parents have witnessed a decline in their child's emotional well-being, behavior and physical health due to decreased activities and exercise during the pandemic. And lastly, that anxiety and depression were the most common mental health challenges leading parents to seek telehealth services for their child during the 2020 year. We are now going to watch a clip from the movie Inside Out. In this clip, you are going to see about a two minute video of a young girl named Riley who just started school in a new school district and had to move away from the first home that she ever knew. So during this clip, please try to pay attention to any possible behavioral signs or physical signs that Riley and or the character Fear exhibit during this clip that may indicate that Riley is experiencing anxiety. And if for whatever reason you cannot hear the audio, please just write it in the chat box. Okay, we got a group of cool girls at two o'clock. How do you know? Double ears pierced, infinity scarf. Whoa, is she wearing eyeshadow? Yeah, we want to be friends with them. Let's go talk to them. Are you kidding? We're not talking to them. We want them to like us. Oh. Wait, what? Almost finished with a potential disasters, where a scenario is either quicksand, spontaneous combustion, or getting called on by the teacher. So as long as none of those happen... Okay, everybody, we have a new student in class today. Are you kidding me? Out of the gates, this is not happening! Riley, would you like to tell us something about yourself? No! Pretend we can't speak English! Don't worry, I got this. Uh, okay. My name is Riley Anderson. I'm from Minnesota, and now I live here. And how about Minnesota? Can you tell us something about it? Well, you certainly get a lot more snow than we do. <laughs> <laughs> She's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it gets pretty cold. The lake freezes over, and that's when we play hockey. I'm on a great team. We're called the Prairie Dogs. My friend Meg plays forward, and my dad's a coach. Pretty much everyone in my family skates. <laughs> it's kind of a family tradition. We go out on the lake almost every weekend. We did, till I moved away. Hey, what Wait, gives? what? Hey, sadness, you touched a memory? We talked about this. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Get back in your circle. <sighs> What's going on? Get out of there, Joy. Yet? We used to play tag and stuff. Cool kids must prank at 3 o'clock. No. Did you see that? Look, oh, no. they're judging us. <laughs> Somebody help me. Grab that. <laughs> Everybody put it in. But everything's different now since we moved. Oh no, we're crying at school! What? Sadness, what are you doing? Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. I, oh. <gasps> it's a core memory. But it's blue. Oh. <gasps> no, wait! Now, looking at that clip, did you notice any behavioral signs that may indicate that Riley was beginning to experience anxiety? So some comments that I'm seeing in the chat right now, um, her eyes widening, initially speaking softly, some of her body language was shrinking into herself, fear running around <laughs> and raising his voice. So these are just some um, apparent warning signs of a child experiencing anxiety An example before we go into the rest of our presentation. So what do our students do? Their family members, their friends, they work, they volunteer, they intern, they have homework, they're in band, they're in sports. Now, during the pandemic, many of our typical activities have changed or have gone on hiatus. However, students have been challenged with adapting to a new way of learning and participating in their activities on virtual platforms, which in many cases can be more stressful or anxiety producing due to the health protocols and social distancing guidelines. So while a lot of these activities may look differently this academic school year, it is important to also recognize that our students are still doing a lot 
while also trying to learn how to participate in these activities in a different way. So what is stress? Stress is a state of tension related to your body attempting to cope with its environment. It's the body's way of preparing to meet a tough situation. Now, stress is individualized. In many cases, stress can be helpful and it can be productive and it can help motivate us to do those things that we need to do, like prepare for a big LA test or prepare for the big soccer game that we're trying to make sure we do our absolute best with. It may be uncomfortable, but it helps with motivating us to do what we need to do. And with stress, everyone experiences different types of symptoms, which can include behavioral, physical, and emotional symptoms. Now, some behavioral signs of stress can include changes in our appetite or our sleep patterns. Some physical signs of stress can be stomach aches, headaches, um, neck and back pain, as well as emotional signs of Stress can include increased irritability, anxiety, depression, feeling overwhelmed, and difficulty in concentrating and motivating. Now, the important factor with stress is stress is temporary. It is normal, and it can be adaptive. And stress typically ends up alleviating once that challenging or perceived challenging event occurs and passes. Now, while stress is temporary, anxiety is anxiety. Anxiety is anxiety, but it is also ongoing. And it, when it becomes anxiety, that's when we have a problem and we do want to be aware of it on how to move forward with addressing it. Additionally, there is a difference between fear versus anxiety. Fear is a response to an immediate threat. For example, if a person is walking in the woods and they come upon a bear, that fear reaction in it and immediately initiates. It's a physiological arousal that immediately initiates. Our heart starts pounding fast. Our brain starts racing. Do I run? Do I stay here? How do I get away from the bear? How do I get to safety? It triggers fight or flight. Anxiety, however, is apprehensive about a perceived or actual future threat. So it's the ruminating. It's the before the actual event occurs. Now, both involve some very similar physiological arousals, and both can be adaptive, and both can help us with getting out of a tough situation. However, additionally, anxiety can help with increasing our preparedness for perceived or actual threat, future threats. So anxiety disorders are the most commonly diagnosed mental health disorders. Again, as I had said previously, some stress and some anxiety can be productive. It can help us with keeping us alert and out of danger. However, we do become concerned when that anxiety becomes constant and uncontrollable, and it starts to interfere with our everyday lives and our everyday functioning, such as being able to take care of our own physical well-being, like sleeping, eating, or even participating in everyday activities like going to school and going to work. Now, some common signs of anxiety in children include somatic symptoms. Typically, we will see somatic symptoms most commonly in our two to 12 year olds. At that point in their developmental stage, most children do not have the language to indicate I am anxious or I am not feeling okay. So they will express it through things such as headaches or constantly going to the school nurse and complaining of a tummy ache, but not having a um, physical reason for why that stomach ache might be occurring. Additional signs of anxiety in children can include avoidance, tantrums, crying, refusing to go to school or participate in any type of transitional activities, having meltdowns after school about homework, as well as some difficulties with settling down for bed or transitioning into the next phase of their, of their day. Now, this next video that we are going to watch is titled Things Students with Anxiety Wish Their Teachers Understood. Now, while this is a parent university presentation, it is important as well for us to watch this video as these are notes that students actually wrote to their teachers about their anxiety related to schoolwork. And we are gonna take a look at that video now.
Now, part of the reason we play that video is it's a very powerful video to see some of the physiological responses that kids are having to anxiety, the way in which it can affect their ability to perform in school and to socialize and to even answer questions in class when the teacher calls on them. Anxiety can have a significant effect on our children's school and their social performance. Especially in during the COVID pandemic, our demands from school and social obligations have changed drastically. A lot of students are struggling with the various demands of school, such as logging into Zoom on time or having the correct Zoom link, depending on what class they have at what hour. Additional aspects that anxiety can interfere with is difficulty with attention, concentrating and motivating themselves to pay attention or complete that school project. Perfectionism. It's not about the doing our best. It's the need to be perfect and how anxiety can interfere with that. Forgetfulness or unwillingness to participate due to concerns about failure or embarrassment. Avoiding difficult tasks. I'm afraid I'm going to fail math, so why bother even trying? and withdrawing from others or situations, and that overall feel or fear of being perceived as unmotivated, lazy, or uninterested in school. Anxiety can have a huge effect on our students and how they overall participate. Additionally, today we're going to talk about test anxiety and how that can have both physical and emotional interference with our child or um, student in school. Some physical signs of test anxiety can include nausea, headaches, heart, papal heart palpitations, fast or shallow breathing, feeling faint, sometimes even inability to concentrate. Additionally, some emotional signs of test anxiety can include irritability, anxiety, fear, frustration, and even feelings of impending doom before taking a test. So test and homework anxiety. Test anxiety is a fear of failing that a person may feel before or while taking an important examination. It's a state of uneasiness and distress that often lowers performance. Now in regards to test anxiety, the biggest important factor is being able to recognize when your child is experiencing either test anxiety, homework anxiety, or even performance anxiety. The strength in being able to recognize it is then we can start to implement some coping strategies, whether it's breathing techniques, mindfulness activities, or other type of resilient activities that my colleague Natalia will be talking about later in this presentation. With test anxiety, homework anxiety, and performance anxiety, we also want to be able to identify positive versus negative thoughts. What are some helpful thoughts? What are some unhelpful thoughts? Like, I'm going to fail. Nothing I do is right. I will never learn this. I'm adapting that to some positive um, thoughts, which again, my colleague Natalia will be talking about shortly. Now, there are three stages of test anxiety. There are the before, the during, and the after. The before, uh, the before stage of test anxiety is typically when a student is beginning to experience that rumination of, I'm not going to do well. I can't learn this. How, how am I going to take this test? I'm going to fail. So some before strategies that a student can do is first try and attend to class and take some good notes. Review one's notes and prior to taking a test, try to self-test yourself on the material. For example, if it's math and you have some math homework that was previously corrected by your teacher and you have the correct answers, try solving another math problem and see how you do and see if you have learned that equation in those strategies. The during, prior to taking the test, take some deep breaths. Reaffirm with yourself that you've done the best you can to retain the knowledge and that you will do well on the test. Read the directions carefully and try to manage your time. While taking the test, if there is a question that you do not know, temporarily skip it and move on to the next one. There's always time to come back to that question. Additionally, try not to panic if you start to see other students turning in their tests. It can be anxiety producing and it can also enhance those ruminating thoughts that may have previously been there.
but know that you are taking your time and using the time that was allotted to you for the entire test period. The after stage of test anxiety, review yourself, review what strategies worked and what didn't work, and especially take note of the strategies that didn't work so that you can readapt your plan for the next test or the next challenge that may come up. Additionally, make sure to celebrate that you overcame this obstacle and that you have made it through that test. And now it's time to move on to the next test. Now, these same principles also apply towards homework anxiety. Now, homework anxiety can be, detriment, well, not detrimental, but homework anxiety can be difficult for students because it can lead to some maladaptive behaviors, whether it's avoidant activities or the procrastination of not wanting to do it. So encourage your child to take it one step at a time, to set up perhaps a calendar or a work schedule where they will work 45 minutes on the assignment and take a 15 minute break prior to going back to it um, and review your assignments with your child, especially if you have the sense that this might be anxiety producing or maybe causing some distress for them. Now, at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Natalia, who's gonna talk more about anxiety and some coping strategies. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So I'm going to continue our presentation from here. And as we discussed earlier, feeling anxious is a natural reaction to a stressful situation. An anxiety disorder can be diagnosed when a child's anxiety interferes with the ability to cope with everyday situations or prompts them to avoid things that most of their kids enjoy. We want to make sure that we pay attention at frequency how often your child experiences the set or pattern of symptoms, duration, how long has it been since the onset of symptoms, has it been a month, three months, or maybe half a year, and the impairment, how do the symptoms interfere with the daily functioning in the familiar setting, whether home or school, and how it interferes with your child's development. If you've determined that your child's behaviors, thoughts, or emotions my call for attention, the next move would be to consult with a professional. If you're not sure where to start to look for help, first step would be reach out to your child's pediatrician or a school counselor, and they will be able to provide you with great resources. And now we're going to move on to discuss coping skills and self-care. And as you probably already know, uh, coping skills are activities or tactics that you use when you're in a stressful situation or experiencing intense emotions. And these are the strategies you can use when you need to buy a little more time or you need a little more energy. And sometimes we try to cope with the feeling out of control by eating, overeating, venting to others or avoiding. But those strategies are always healthy and sometimes make things worse. It is important to learn effective coping skills rather than maladaptive coping strategies. Self-care, on the other hand, is something that you do regardless of your stress level. Self-care is seen as a preventative measure that can decrease the need for coping skills in the future. And it works this way because attending to your emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical health will decre decrease extreme distress and burnout that requires us to cope in the first place. When we are running on empty energy, we are more sensitive to stress and less likely to adapt to a stressful situation effectively. Coping skills help you in the short term to cope with intense emotions and prevent you from acting impulsively. They're essential when you're overwhelmed with emotions, but to be the most uh, effective and to find lasting solutions to the issues, coping skills need to be paired with the self-care. And that's why it is important to practice self-care daily and to reduce the need to use coping skills. And now we're going to review uh, some of the examples of self-care activities that you and your uh, kids can try to practice daily. And they're very simple. And I'm sure that many of you are already doing this, like having a set routine, taking breaks, journaling, practicing uh, meditation, having quality time with your family members, uh, setting appropriate boundaries and limits, and going on nature walks. So all of these are great examples. And now we're going to discuss the differences between the fixed and the growth mindset. 
uh, research in this field discovered that individuals' mindset might predict how well they will do in various areas of their lives, including uh, their job, school, arts, and even social relationship with others. It is believed that having a fixed mindset means believing that your characteristics, traits, and your abilities are set and unchangeable. You can imagine how difficult it would be for a student with a fixed mindset to overcome social and anxiety. They might think, I am a shy person by nature and I was born that way. There is no way I'll ever feel comfortable making a presentation in front of the others. There is no way I'll overcome that. Individuals with growth mindset believe that their qualities and achievements can be developed through personal effort. So an individual with a growth mindset thinks, I can change and improve myself with effort and experience, I'll do well. So children who understand that the brain can get smarter, those who have growth mindset, they do better in school because they have an empowering perspective on learning. They focus on improvement and see effort as a way to build their abilities. They see failure as a natural part of the learning process. So on this slide, you can see some of the examples of how you can help your kids to change a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. For example, if your child says, this is too hard, make a suggestion for them to change the word to, it might take more time and effort for me, but I will master it. I can do that. Um, and now we're going to talk about the mindfulness activities. So when we're feeling anxious, we get all wrapped up in our worrisome thoughts and think about everything that could go wrong. We have an overwhelming and unpleasant feeling that something bad might happen in the future. And an anxious brain can be very creative and can come up with the most amazing worst case scenarios possibly be. So when we do this, we can notice the pleasant experience all around us and we can function. So mindfulness is a therapeutic coping strategy that can induce the relaxation response. And this response engages our parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for restoring our body's base levels after stress response. It helps us to calm down by lowering our heart rate and blood pressure. Being mindful means paying attention to the present moment exactly as it is. It is really hard to be anxious if you are completely focused on the present moment. What are you sensing and doing right now and not having regrets about the past, not thinking about your mistakes or not thinking about what might happen in the future. And you can see some of the mindfulness activities listed on this slide. And I'm going to walk you through one of the easiest one that works well with younger and older kids. It is called color counting. So for color counting, sit comfortably in the quiet room. To feel more grounded, put your both feet on the floor and look around. Think about the colors of the rainbow. So try finding objects that are red in the room. Notice how many objects that are red. Observe the objects. Then move on to the next color. Try finding yellow objects. How many are there there? Observe them. So once you're done with all the colors, uh, do a check-in with yourself. How are you feeling right now? How is your anxiety level? Is your breathing slow? Are you ready to move on and do what you were doing? Or maybe you need to do another mindfulness activity. So we are hoping that these mindful activities will be helpful for you and your children. So when pandemic started about more than a year ago, it changed many aspects of our lives and we all experienced to some extent changes in our daily routines, work environments. Uh, there was social isolation and loneliness. Um, there, some people experienced financial issues due to job loss. Uh, there were reports of increase in anxiety and stress triggered by uncertainty. Uh, there is also a lot of people experiencing increased depressive symptoms. And of course, there are many grief and loss issues associated with this illness and loss of family members. So we thought it would be helpful if we shared this set of practical tips, coping with COVID, that was developed by Dr. Harris. This is um, 
a five minute video that you're going to watch. <laughs> When we face a crisis of any sort, fear and anxiety are inevitable. They are normal natural responses to any challenging situation infused with danger and uncertainty. Face COVID is a set of practical steps for dealing with such situations. F is for focus on what's in your control. You can't control what happens in the future. You can't control coronavirus itself or the world economy or what other people do. And you can't magically control your thoughts and feelings. Fear, anxiety and worry are inevitable. But you can control what you do here and now. So let's focus on that. A is for acknowledge your thoughts and feelings. Silently and kindly acknowledge whatever is showing up inside you. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, sensations, urges. With curiosity, notice what's going on in your inner world. You might say to yourself, I am noticing feelings of anxiety. Or I'm having thoughts about getting sick. Or I'm having feelings of loneliness. And as you continue acknowledging your thoughts and feelings, bring in the next step, which is C, come back into your body. Find your own way of connecting with your physical body. For example, you might try slowly pressing your feet hard into the floor or slowly pressing your fingertips together, slowly stretching your arms or your neck or shrugging your shoulders or slowly breathing. And as you acknowledge your thoughts and feelings and come back into your body, you then move to E, which is for engage in what you're doing. Get a sense of where you are here and now and refocus your attention on the activity at hand. Notice five things you can see, five things you can hear. Notice what you can touch and taste and smell. Notice what you are doing and give your full attention to that activity. And then C is for committed action. This means effective action guided by your core values. Action you take because it's important to you, even if it brings up difficult thoughts and feelings. Of course, this includes following official guidelines on what to do during this crisis. But in addition, ask yourself regularly, what can I do right now, no matter how small it may be, that improves life for myself or others I live with or people in my community? And whatever the answer is, do it and engage in it fully. O is for opening up. This means making room for difficult feelings and being kind to yourself. As this crisis unfolds, we'll all feel fear, anxiety, anger, sadness, guilt, loneliness, and so on. We can't stop these painful feelings from arising, but we can open up and make room for them, acknowledge they are normal, allow them to be there even though they hurt, and treat ourselves kindly. Consider what a kind words you can say to yourself and kind things you can do for yourself to help you cope with this suffering. V is for values. Committed action should be guided by your core values. What do you want to stand for in the face of this crisis? What sort of person do you want to be as you go through this? How do you want to treat yourself and others? Your values might include love, respect, humor, patience, courage, honesty, caring, openness, kindness, compassion, or numerous others. Look for ways to sprinkle your values into your day and let them guide and motivate your actions. I is for identify resources. Identify resources for help, assistance, support, and advice. This includes friends, family, neighbors, health professionals, and emergency services. Make sure you know the emergency helpline phone numbers, including those for psychological help if required. D is for disinfect and distance. 
Remember to disinfect regularly and practice physical distancing for the greater good of your community. Please run through the steps of face COVID as often as you can for the benefit of yourself, your loved ones, and all the people in your community. Thank you for watching this video with us. We are hoping that you found these uh, strategies helpful. And now we're going to move on to discuss resilience. As parents, we are naturally worried about our children when we see them experiencing anxiety, sadness, and any behavior challenges. We are also wondering how all of this will affect our kids in the long term. Well, this situation has been difficult for everyone. The good news is that kids are resilient and parents, teachers, and other supportive adults can, can help to foster that resilience. So what is resilience? It is the ability to experience a significant stress and still thrive, being able to overcome the difficulties, and it also an ability to bounce back from adverse events or circumstances. Many children, especially young kids, have a lot of natural resilience. And resilience can also be strengthened like a muscle or skill. It can be viewed as a combination of both internal and external support. An example of internal resilience would be having an optimistic outlook, having good problem solving skills, self-esteem, self-efficacy, emotional flexibility, active lifestyle, emotional regulation, and empathy. We can teach these skills to children or strengthen the skills that they already have. While external support would be at least one strong and stable supportive relationship with an adult. That could be a family member, teacher, or a coach, someone that child trusts and that can be there for them in difficult moment. In the same way that some children are good at math, music, or sports, resilience come more naturally to some than others. So if you have an easygoing child, they might adapt more easily to the changes going on right now. If you have an anxious child, they might need a little extra external support like hugs, reassurance, and teaching, but they can also develop internal resilience. It is important to remember that regardless of child's innate internal resilience, we can coach and support them to develop resilient skills. And next, uh, we would like to share with you some effective strategies for managing your child's anxiety at home. So it will be good to be consistent in how you handle problems, administer discipline, and provide consequences. Not having a routine and not knowing what to expect can be an anxiety provoking for some children. So try to maintain um, consistent but flexible routines for homework, chores, any other activities that they do. Be patient and be prepared to listen. Maybe set time aside to talk to your child about what worries them. You can let them know ahead of time, for example, that after dinner, you would like to spend time together to talk about their feelings and what worries them. Do not treat their feelings, questions, and statements about feelings anxious as silly or unimportant. It is also a good idea to check with yourself. Do you have realistic goals and expectations for your child? Are you ready to accept any limitations that they might have? Do not tell your children that perfection is accepted or expected or is acceptable. Teach them that mistakes are normal part of growing up and that no one is expected to do everything equally well or perfect. Try to praise and reinforce the effort, even if success is less than expected. And if your child feels anxious in social interactions, you can help by doing role plays or practicing with them their presentations ahead of time. Also, you can teach your child simple strategies to manage their anxiety by doing mindfulness or grounding skills. Also seek outside help if the problem persists and continues to interfere with the daily activities. And we also have some more tips and recommendations that could help you and your child to deal with worries, stress, and anxiety. Remember the children experience the feelings, worries, and fear of those around them. So try keeping calm and that may help your children as well. 
be aware of your child's behavior and emotions. So try to pay attention to any significant changes in their behaviors, mood, appetite, sleep. Are there any changes in the way they fall asleep? How long they stay asleep? Maybe they're struggling to fall asleep because they worry excessively. Encourage your child to share with you how they feel and try to validate th those feelings. Um, <clears throat> teach and model good emotional response. So check in again with yourself. Um, are you reacting to the situation with a panic or are you responding to the situation in a calm and thoughtful way and offer some good solutions? You can also create a toolbox for your children uh, by writing down effective coping strategies and self-care activities on small pieces of paper and then doing them when your child experiences stress or increase in anxiety. We would also like to share that there is a parent support available through NAMI, which is National Alliance for Mental Illness. Uh, this is a family-focused program to support parents and caregivers who are concerned about their kids' struggles with an anxiety, depression, or any other emotional issues. Uh, this program, they host regular monthly meetings. Uh, right now, they're held virtually um, to make sure that everyone is safe. So we have a, a website listed here and their contact information as well. And on the next slide, we have some <clears throat> self-care applications that you can try. Uh, they provide with a variety of guided medication activities, mindfulness techniques, mood trackers, inspirational quotes, and help you set up and stay on track with your personal goals. Here we have some more helpful resources. There are several websites um, that provide uh, a lot of great practical suggestions on helping with managing your child's anxiety. For example, there is National Association of School Psychologists. They have great resources about general information on various anxiety disorders and helpful handouts for parents. Then there is also the Child Mind Institute. This uh, website provides psychoeducational information about an anxiety and several resources for addressing children's anxiety at home and at school. Then there is a great website, Coping Skills for Kids. They have a variety of great suggestions, strategies, and videos to watch for an anxiety management then there is an Anxiety and Depression Association of America. They have great tips for parents and caregivers on how to help youth manage their anxiety. And also they have Directory of Licensed Mental Health Professionals who specialize in treating an anxiety disorders. And also uh, there is um, Rutgers Graduate School of Applied Professional Psychology. They uh, specialize in treating um, an anxiety and depression. Uh, so you can contact them as well. There are more mental health resources and um, suicide prevention uh, hotlines. Other mental health resources. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lee McDonald um, to speak more about community partnerships. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, before I talk about some of the partnerships, I did also post in the chat, which we've opened uh, for questions, general questions, a couple sites. One is uh, a wellness website as part of the district's wellness work uh, that just highlights some healthy coping mechanisms that you can uh, do with your kids. You can adopt yourself daily routines, uh, whether that's mindfulness, thinking about nutrition, exercise and whatnot. Uh, the other is a link off the district website that highlights uh, many of the, the resources which were just shared here, but also some uh, different tips uh, for parents with regards to uh, supporting their children through coping with COVID. Um, the other slide, and we'll make sure the slide deck is available on the district website as well under the uh, counseling department webpage, uh, Parent University. Uh, but the other slide, previous slide speaks to a partnership uh, with our Traumatic Loss Coalition and our Mercer County Superintendents a few years there, uh, that started a few years ago, just bringing about awareness, uh, suicide awareness. So it's something we continue to do in articulation with uh, our friends and colleagues in other districts. So just wanted to highlight uh, all of those uh, valuable resources and then obviously open it up for any questions uh, to our attendees tonight.
Okay, that should be open. Just double check on your end. So Lee, um, at this time, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box. No, that's that's correct. No, nothing coming forward in the chat box. Obviously, look, if it, we, we recognize this is a sensitive topic, so uh, please reach out individually uh, to myself, Ms. Colello, Ms. Piotrowski, if we can be of assistance. Um, I mentioned before, we, we have a phenomenal counseling staff, school counseling, child study team, uh, other supports available, obviously our UBHC clinicians. Uh, so if there's something that uh, we can support you through by all means, uh, please let us know. But pleasure joining you and uh, presenting this evening. Thank you and have a great night.